And let's move on. And Dr. Cole, uh, I want to get into a topic here because it's so important, uh, and especially uh, discussing uh, these times with uh, the coronavirus. But um, uh, donated tissue, cartilage transplants. Uh, we've got a great guest on the line, Jonathan Boyd, a director of certification and online earning, American Association of Tissue Banks. But I want to start with Dr. Cole. Uh, talk about the importance in your practice, Dr. Cole, before we bring Jonathan on to, to talk about. About, uh, tissue donation. I think people often think of tissue donation, Steve, as heart, liver, and lungs, and certainly we've covered this on our show in the past. And um, as an orthopedic surgeon, and we we have a big multi-specialty practice, and virtually every specialty, whether it's spine, foot and ankle, hand, and sports, uh, and tumor, um, we utilizes uh, human tissue. And um, that could be ligaments, it could be cartilage, it could be tendon, it could be bone. Bone is a really frequent one that we utilize to help people today. So it's we always we sort of say it's a gift of hope. It may not always be a gift of life, a gift of life, but it it actually it has a huge role in helping our patients where they need tissue that they can't actually get from themselves. What we call autograph tissue. This is called allograft tissue. It comes from someone else, and there there could be a, you know 50 to 100 different applications. And I would say, you know, at least 25 percent of my surgeries involved involves some type of donor tissue. So it's a critical part of taking care of patients with musculoskeletal problems. Well, that's interesting. Well, Jonathan Boyd, thanks for joining us here on Sports Medicine Weekly on this Sunday morning. Again, the Director of Certification Online Earning American Association of Tissue Banks, otherwise known as AATB. John, what is uh, AATB and how do you work with tissue organizations? Right. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Uh, so AATB is a nonprofit organization and we work with tissue organizations either involved in the surgical recovery or as some people may refer to it as procurement of tissue, as well as the processing, storage, and ultimately the distribution of these tissues for the use in surgical procedures. Uh, so we work with about 120 organizations that are accredited through AATB, both domestically and internationally. Uh, we have about 3,000 people that are certified tissue bank specialists or CTBS, so we have all of acronyms. And we support these organizations not only by providing uh, best practices, development of standards and education uh, and continued education, things like certification, uh, but we also work with organizations like the FDA, CDC, and HHS to develop practices. Uh, and the ATV is recognized as having some of the most robust standards and practices, uh, which is why we have that international presence. And this will include things like the development of practices surrounding surgical prep uh, for the donor recovery, screening protocols and testing, things like microbiology testing, infectious disease testing and screening. Uh, and basically our, our goal in all of this is to the, mitigate the risk of potential exposure or transmission of infectious disease and to assure that tissue is viable uh, for the procedures like Dr. Cole discussed. What, what's when people ask um, about the process? Because I think a lot of people think of tissue transplantation as, as I said, heart, liver, and lungs, and don't really know that a huge part of uh, the benefit of being a donor uh, to recipients has has this application with tendons and bone and cartilage and so forth. What's the difference, you know, the, when you are dealing with these organ procurement organizations and so forth, is it the same donors that provide the same tissue or do, is there a selective difference in terms of if you're a donor and the, and the family's involved, do they sometimes say, well, I, you, they can be a heart donor but not a tissue donor? How does, how does that sort of play out in the real world? Well, there's a lot of overlap uh, and there's also a lot of difference. Uh, there's many differences in the cases specifically in regard to tissue screening and tissue safety. Uh, but someone can be both an organ and a tissue donor, or if they have elected uh, first-person authorization like you have on your driver's license or, or what most people think of as uh, signing up at the DMV, someone can elect what they want to donate in many cases. Or uh, if the opportunity for donation is presented to the next of kin or the family, at the time of death, uh, then they may select exactly what they want to donate or not to donate. The, some of the primary differences uh, that really come up uh, is in the basis for screening. So potential donors uh, are evaluated for safety and for quality, both for organ and tissue. But there's a national shortage for donated organs. 
Uh, so thousands of people are on the waiting list, and people die every day waiting for, for organs. Uh, and the majority of these deaths occur outside of, or the majority of deaths in the United States occur outside of hospitals, which means that many people that do sign up to be donors don't have the opportunity uh, to be donors just based on how those death referrals work and recovery and those practices, et cetera. Uh, on the other hand, tissue can be donated in a much more wide range of cases, and donation can occur when deaths occur outside of the house, hospital and even hours after death. Uh, this is because tissue is structural, right, where organs have to be functional. And the big focus and the difference on how we screen organ versus tissue uh, is based on the risk benefit. Um, so there's a shortage of organs, but there's not a shortage of tissues. And many procedures that tissues use for are elective, like ACL and PCL repair. Uh, so this means the way we evaluate these cases has to be uh, pretty different. So my mother, for example, was a liver and kidney transplant recipient. And her donor had a history of intravenous drug use, and that's considered increased risk for organ. But my mother probably would have died uh, within months had she not been transplanted. Uh, the risk of communicable disease did not outweigh the risk of being transplanted with uh, that increased risk. However, no one's going to die without an ACL or PCL repair. So cases like this would likely not be permissible to move forward with tissue. So uh, there is still similar screening. The same questions are asked to the family. Medical records are still reviewed. Uh, the same infectious disease testing is completed uh, for both organ and tissue, but it's just a different balance on what the, the risk is versus what the potential benefit could be for the recipient. Uh, one of the other benefits is, I mean, one of the other similarities, I should say, is that the donor family has the option to receive follow-up in both organ and tissue cases. It's far less frequent in the case of tissue. Uh, in many instances, a medical provider may not completely convey that the donor had a choice or the family made a decision to donate, and that's where that graft or that gift came from. And that kind of dehumanizes the, the concept when it's referred to as, as a cadaver versus a donor. Uh, so each graft is unique as well and can actually be traced back to the donor. Uh, so where it's not as immediate or as much instant gratification, I guess, uh, with organ, there still is that ability for a patient to send a thank you card to follow up. And in some instances, we've even had at our, our conferences, for example, where the donor families were able to meet recipients of their loved one's tissue. Yeah, we're visiting with Jonathan Boyd from the American Association of Tissue Banks. I'm Steve Cashel with Dr. Brian Cole. You're listening to Sports Medicine Weekly here on 670 The Score, coming your way each and every Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Uh, Jonathan, has um, the American Association of Tissue Banks established criteria for screening potential donors uh, for COVID-19? Yes. So as we discussed uh, we do have defined practices, questions that have to be asked. Uh, and there's a scrupulous evaluation that's completed on every potential tissue donor. Uh, this includes not only medical records, whether that's emergency services reports, hospital records, and at times even primary care records, uh, but it also includes a detailed interview that's completed with the family. So many of the standard risk questions already encompass many of the things that are indicators uh, for potential COVID-19 exposure. And the FDA does not recommend a swab test or a, a PCR test on every potential donor if they are asymptomatic. Uh, but we have provided general guidelines to help organizations evaluate potential donors. Uh, the risk-averse approach continues uh, with COVID-19. So many of these practices are already covered. So screening for things like uh, active symptoms, like a cough or fever uh, surrounding or recently uh, to the time of death or the time of donation, uh, or if they have been in close contact with someone who has been positive. If any of these type of uh, criteria are identified in that screening process, uh, the potential donor would not be eligible and uh, organizations would not move forward with the donation process. 
we're still really concerned with the respiratory route. Um, but to my knowledge, blood transmission, it's not like, this is not the same thing as hepatitis HIV. It's still generally mm-hmm. believed this is, um, you know, res- largely respiratory transmission. So um, I feel pretty safe in the operating room, for example, when we're dealing with musculoskeletal tissue as not posing excess risk, even if a patient was positive, uh, as long as you respect the respiratory pathway. But I'm curious, mm-hmm. does lung transplantation, which is also a big part of tissue, does that have any differentiating criteria for COVID right now? Uh, my understanding from uh, folks I've talked with on the organ side of things is that uh, a lung transplant would not move forward if the potential donor was COVID positive. They test them deliberately because it sounds like some of the testing is, is more by screening, but uh, mm-hmm. otherwise, if you had lung transplant, I, I imagine that maybe comes to a different criteria. I was just interested to know. Right, right. Yeah, the inpatient uh, or in hospital cases uh, have a significant uh, High, like a much higher range of uh, testing that's completed because the opportunity is there, right? They're actively being worked up. Labs and chemistry can be requested. Uh, for the tissue side of things, it's also important to note that uh, we routinely uh, publish guidelines. AATB has a designated group of licensed physicians that our physicians council uh, that offer directives and guidelines that are built off of uh, recommendations from the FDA and CDC. And finally, uh, Jonathan, I appreciate you joining us again. Jonathan Boyd, our guest from the American Association of Tissue Banks. Uh, tell our listeners how they can get involved. Boy, you, you really uh, have a great case here for uh, people that um, really should think about uh, donating. Great. Thank you. So to learn more about tissue, there's a lot more information on our website at aetb.org. And as far as donor registry, more information can be found uh, on Donate Life America's webpage. AATB.org. Yes, sir. Wonderful. Jonathan Boyd, uh, Director of Certification Online Earning, American Association of Tissue Banks. Thanks for what you do and uh, giving us a a great... uh, analysis and uh, telling us uh, all about uh, how important it is for cartilage transplants and donated tissue. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. All right. We're going to take a break here on Sports Medicine Weekly. When we return, Dr. Cole and I will be back with our Ask the Doctor segment. We'll tell you all about it. Got some great questions for the doc this morning. You're listening to Sports Medicine Weekly only on 670 The Score.